Let's pray, shall we? Almighty God, how unworthy we are to share a relationship with you, but we're grateful that you have made it possible for us to do so through the sacrifice of your only son. We thank you now for the opportunity we have before us to open up your word and to gain from it exactly what you see fit this morning. And I pray that that will be the case, that you will use your word to touch our hearts in a mighty way, to encourage us, to bless us, and ultimately to help us nurture that relationship we have with you. And we give you the praise and the glory and the adoration in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Let me invite you, if you would, to grab your Bibles and turn to our text for this morning in 1 John chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 13 through 18 this morning. And if you haven't been with us for a little while, uh, you, we've been studying through the Apostle John's letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, in the series of messages that we've entitled Reality Check. And all along, John has been laying out for us, and for, and for his readers, both way back then and right now, the truth in the reality in order to combat and correct some false teachings, specifically of two specific groups. Some of them were called the Gnostics, who were claiming that they had this higher knowledge and this greater spiritual connection with God. And then there were these other guys on the other side, some of them were a little bit connected somewhat, who were called the Docetists. And they were the ones who who had taught that it was impossible for a holy God to have an intimate connection with humans because according to their teaching, human bodies were completely sinful and they could not be occupied by a holy God. Well, that just flies in the face of the reality, as John teaches us here, of Jesus who came into this world as God in the flesh, as God and man. So John has really been telling us like it really is. He's intent on sharing with his readers the truth about how Jesus served to connect God with humanity. And all along that, with that, he focuses our faith and our obedience and our love on him. And how all three of those things work together in that relationship that we have with God and in our relationships with other people. Now we've covered a lot of ground. And as he begins to turn his discussion in a slightly different direction, John is gracious enough here to give us a review of his main points, especially when it comes to our remaining with God. You remember that mixing together of our relationship with God and with us. So let's get right in and take a look at what he says here by way of review in 1 John chapter 4, verses 13 through 16 here at first. 1 John 4 starting in verse 13. He says, This is how we know that we remain in Him and He in us. He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen, he's talking about we the apostles, we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent His Son as the world's Savior. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in Him and He in God. And we have come to know and believe, to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. So how do we know that our lives have been mixed up together with God in this intimate relationship? We've received the indwelling Holy Spirit. We've talked about this. We trust the testimony of the apostles who have seen and have heard and have touched Jesus and who were eyewitnesses of God's love that he revealed among them. More than that, we have personally placed our faith in Christ, so much so that we freely acknowledge with our lips and with our lives, and we confess that Jesus is indeed God's Son. And that is a pleasure for us, because we recognize that it is through Jesus Christ that we have received and experienced God's love. Through Christ's selfless and sinless sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, He has saved us from our sins and the death that we deserve. This is how we know and that we remain in God and God remains in us. Now up to this point in this major section of this 
of this letter, starting in chapter 4, verse 7, John has been emphasizing each believer's need to love one another. But after this short review, he shifts his focus to a more foundational subject. Each believer's love for the Father. And it's kind of one of those which came first, the chicken or the egg type of a, a discussions here. And if, you're, if you've always been, you know, you've always wondered what the answer to that question is, I got to tell you, it's the chicken. Go look back at Genesis chapter 1 verse 21, day 5, the chicken came first. End of discussion. But I digress here. We're not talking chickens, we're talking about God and our relationship with Him. And between the verses that we're going to cover this week and the ones that we're going to be seeing next week, we'll see that when it comes to that question, which comes first, our love for God or our love for each other, the answer is our love for God. Our love for God serves as that foundation, and then our love for one another is built upon that. And unless we first love God with everything that we are, we will be unable to love our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. But, unfortunately, a huge wrench gets thrown into the love machinery, even among believers. It goes by the name of Chris's phobia. Now, you probably recognize the phobia part, which refers to the fear of something. And a lot of time when we think of phobias, and there are many of them, phobias typically are fears that, that completely cripple people, that keep them from operating entirely. But what is this word chrysis? Well, John uses it right here in our passage. So let's see if you can find it as we read the rest of these verses. 1 John 4, starting in verse 17. He says, In this... Love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. So do you have any guesses as to what this Chris's part of Chris's phobia might be? What do you think it is? Punishment is one option. Starts with a J. Judgment. Judgment is the Chris's part of Chris's phobia. And this is a judicial word that refers to this separating. The separating of right from wrong where a decision must be made by a judge. And Scripture is clear that there will be a day of judgment that will take place for every person. Back in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14, it says, For God will bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. And then in the New Testament, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may be repaid for what is done in the body, whether good or evil. When it comes to our judgment, we're talking about eternity here. And when that time comes, when we are on trial, and... Where the, where the outcome of our judgment comes is going to be determined. It's going to be a matter of determining where we spend eternity. Depending on God's righteous judgment, we will either share eternal life in this loving relationship with God, or we will experience what Scripture calls a second death, which is this eternal separation from God and the life that is made possible with Him. So it's a no-brainer for us to figure out what the most desirable option is. And yet, being fully aware of our limited capabilities and our tendency to slip into sin and disobedience, it is easy for us to become uneasy and fearful when it comes to our time for judgment. And especially as that time for judgment approaches. And you know, on one level, that makes sense. No one in their right mind enjoys and gets excited about getting what they deserve, do you? Are you one of those crazy people? 
No one really wants to be punished for what they've done. So it makes sense at the very least that we would have this sense of dread over the coming judgment. But on another level, and yes, even believers sometimes fall into this, on another level we might even have this fear of finding ourselves on the wrong side of justice. This is a difficult reality for us to face. So we ask, is it really possible for people who claim to be followers of Jesus to suffer from Chris's phobia? Is it possible for us to live in fear of the judgment? Unfortunately, this happens way too often. So we have to ask the question, why? Why are some believers so afraid of the judgment? Well, I believe that it is often because we allow the enemy's voice to speak louder than our Lord's voice. Brothers and sisters, this is such a big deal that I think that it's important for us to talk about these things for a few moments. You know, over the years, I've run across enough people who claim to be Christians who have found themselves crippled by this fear. And it's usually tied to listening to Satan's voice more often than God's voice. You see, as we've talked about before, Satan is the accuser. That's what his name means, and that is exactly what he does. He accuses us. He's that prosecuting attorney who will present to God, the judge, all of the evidence against us to make sure that in the end, we are condemned and sentenced and we're going to experience that death that we deserve. But there are three things we got to remember about our enemy. And the first is that he is impatient. Our enemy is impatient. Satan cannot wait to condemn us. So he doesn't wait to reveal all the evidence that he has against us, but for the time being, he's not presenting our condemning evidence to God. No, he shares it with us in our minds. He reminds us often of our missteps, our disobedience to God, and our sins against him and against the people around us in order to steal our joy in order to kill our hope of eternal life and to destroy our faith in God and the relationship that we might have with Him. So first, Satan is impatient. The second thing we've got to remember is that our enemy is a liar. In fact, everything he says is a lie. Jesus refers to Satan in John chapter 8, verse 44 as the father of lies, and he says that, that lies are his native tongue. So whenever his lips are moving, we can be confident that what he is saying is untrue. And the third thing is that we need to remember is that our enemy wants us dead. He wants us dead. Satan knows that human beings are God's most prized creatures, and he's well aware that when contrasted with all of the other animals, all of the other creatures God made, God made humans to be very special and unique. God made us to be made in his own image and able to share this intimate relationship with him. None of the animals can do that like we can. But because of his hatred toward God, the enemy is bound and determined to draw as many men and as many women away from God and toward himself in this effort to kill us. So in his efforts to destroy us, the enemy's voice echoes in our minds, saying such things as, you're not good enough. You have no worth. Your mess-ups are beyond repair. You have no hope. You have nothing to look forward to but hell. Brothers and sisters, the reality is that our enemy, Satan, is the one who wants us dead to kill us, and to kill our relationship with God. So this may be a dumb question. But why would we want to let his voice speak louder than God's? I mean, we've already talked about some of these things that we need to be remembering about our enemy, but maybe we need to think about what we need need to remember about God. 
And I think it's especially important for us to recall some very important things that are counter to what the enemy is as we talk about and remember who God is. And the first thing is that while the enemy is impatient, God is patient. That's what his word says. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 tells us that the Lord does not delay his promise as some understand delay, but he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. That right there is where Peter's telling it like it is. Yes, we have been promised that the risen Jesus will return to the earth and at that time, he will usher in our judgment. But that verse also tells us that it is not God's desire like Satan's for us, to his most beloved creatures, to die. Instead, we need to remember that God wants us to have eternal life. And that is the very reason Jesus came to the earth as God in the flesh in the first place. You've heard it a bunch of times, but it is always worth hearing again. John 3, 16 and 17. For God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, will not die, will not be eternally destroyed, but will have eternal life. For God did not send the world, the Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Those words and so many others are recorded in the God-breathed Scripture. And every word in the Bible is reliable. We can count on it because it comes from God Himself. And that's where a third thing that we need to remember about God is that God is truth. Everything God says is true. So again, I ask, why would we want to let our enemy's voice speak louder than God's? We wouldn't. And we shouldn't. So instead of allowing Satan's condemning accusations echo in our minds between our ears, let us fill our minds with God's Word where we can hear His voice speaking truth and life. So what does He say? Well, take a look at this list. These are just some of the Scripture references of things that God says. He says, I love you. You are my beloved child. I knit you together in your mother's womb. And I know that you have sinned against me. I know that you deserve to die because of it. But I bought you with the price of my blood. I died in your place for your forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, Our enemy wants us to be condemned and dead apart from God. So his voice is one that fills us with fear. And he knows that our fear can serve as a very effective tool to gain control over us and kill us if, and only if, we let it. But that's not how God operates. Our Lord highly values us and He wants us to be raised to life. But the tool that He uses to influence us is not fear. Instead, it is fear repellent. It's a crazy little thing. Actually, no, it's a crazy big thing called love. And God's voice speaking always communicates His love. But instead of Instead of it filling us with dread and uncertainty and fear, His voice fills us with hope and joy and comfort and peace. So if we suffer from Chris's phobia, if we're crippled by the fear of the judgment of God, something is wrong, something's out of whack. Again, back to our passage in chapter 4, verse, 4, verse 18. John tells us what it is. He tells us that the one who fears is not complete in love. 
putting this in other words, the, the commentary writer Warren Wiersbe says that, that such people continue in fear because they are not growing in the love of God. Or as the late Lutheran theologian and commentary writer R.C.H. Lenski puts it, if you still fear punishment from God, you have prevented his love, from, uh, his love for, for you from remitting or forgiving your sins and thus planting sure confidence of your heart instead of this fear. John says it pretty plainly. He says there's no fear in love. Instead, perfect love casts out fear. It drives out fear. So I have to ask you, have you experienced the perfect and complete love of God? Have you heard of the sacrifice that he gave you on the cross of Christ? If you haven't heard that, you haven't been listening this morning. Have you chosen by faith to receive his gift of forgiveness? Have you placed your full trust in him so that, that when that time comes for your own judgment, that you have no fear of condemnation or death? If you find yourself fearing the judgment, the big question to ask yourself is this. Was Christ's sacrifice not good enough? Let me share with you just a few verses to let you decide for yourself. John 5, verse 24, he says, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under the judgment, but has passed from death to life. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 3. Therefore, it, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. And Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10, 12, and 14. We have been sanctified. We've been made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. But this man Jesus, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. For by one offering he has perfected, he has made complete forever those who are being sanctified. Of course, those are just a few of the verses in the whole of Scripture that talk about the sacrifice of Christ. And I challenge you for your, to do for yourself, to discover for yourself the truth of God's Word, that Christ's sacrifice was not just good enough, but complete and perfect. Through the gift of His one and only Son, God perfectly loved you with the cross. Jesus has taken the punishment that you deserved. He has received the sentence that was coming to us at our own judgment. So when that time comes, and the enemy presents all the evidence proving our guilt and pushing for us to receive the death penalty, our Lord Jesus Christ, the one John refers to in chapter 2 verse 1 as our advocate, will point to the crucifixion marks in his hands and in his feet and the, the wound in his side. And he'll say, I love him. I love her. And his punishment, her punishment has been paid in full. It is finished. As we close our time together this morning, I find myself holding on to Paul's words from Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, close to my heart. And I hope you do too. Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Brothers and sisters, our relationship with God has been repaired and restored. And now because of Jesus, we are able to remain in his love and to remain in God without fear of falling on the wrong side of judgment. So you might say that God's love is the greatest of all fear repellents. So we have no reason to be plagued by Chris's phobia. 
We have no reason to be afraid of God's judgment because we know what the outcome will be. And as we continue on next week, we'll see that, we, that the love that we share with God is the foundation for our love that we share with each other. But for now, until we get to that point, let's pray. Precious God, it is a blessing for us to remember that when it comes to our judgment, and we each know, God, that that will be unpleasant because every hidden thing, as your word tells us, will be revealed. And I know that each one of us know what those hidden things are, but God, we know that they will be revealed and and yet even those things that condemn us here on, in our own minds and in our hearts, it's important for us to remember the truth that you've already taken care of those things. You've taken care of every sin, every misstep, whether they've been deliberate or indeliberate, whatever they may be, God, that you've taken them to the cross. Jesus' sinless blood has been shed so that we might be forgiven that all of those things will be looked over by because the blood of Christ is all over them and they will be seen no more. Thank you so much for the ability we have to share that, return, that eternal relationship with you because of the blood of Christ. And for that, we give you the praise and the adoration and the glory and the honor that you deserve. Thank you so much for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.